The Philosophy of Praxis, Marx, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School by Andrew Feenberg. This is chapter five, The Realization of Philosophy. The Heritage of Classical German Philosophy. Etienne Gilson's book, The Unity of Philosophical Experience, traced the effects of certain fundamental problems in the philosophical tradition as they worked themselves out in a succession of thinkers from antiquity to modern times. I too am interested in a philosophical experience, but my story is not so ambitious. I focus on the struggle of four modern thinkers to carry out the specific philosophical program of the philosophy of praxis. This program involves a social critique of idealism while preserving the structural features of the idealist subject-object relation. Like Gilson's philosophers, mine run into problems working out the implications of their program. There are two central problems, the status of science and technology in a radical social version of philosophical idealism and the historical contingency of a social resolution of philosophical antinomies. The philosophers of praxis offer various solutions to these problems and are forced by changing historical circumstances to reformulate the program. Within this larger framework, history and class consciousness itself contains a remarkable study of the particular philosophical experience of German idealism. This is the best description of the second part of the reification essay, which surveys the history of classical German philosophy. Lucas develops a metacritique of the various positions taken in the course of the progress from Kant to Hegel and relates them to the cultural contradiction of capitalism. For Lucas, traditional philosophy is in essence theory of culture that does not know itself as such. Philosophy reflects on cultural structures, forms of objectivity, that it misinterprets as eternal principles disconnected from the accidents of history and social life. Yet, in spite of this systematic misconstruction of culture, philosophy is important insofar as it thematizes cultural presuppositions and exposes them to discussion and criticism. Philosophy has a unique contribution to make to a social theory that wants to understand its own place in a process of cultural transformation, of which it is a part. This explains why the heart of Lucas's most important work is devoted to an extended analysis of the history of modern philosophy. In the foreword to History and Class Consciousness, Lucas says it is of practical importance to return in this respect to, to the traditions of Marx's interpretation founded by Engels, who regarded the German workers' movement as the heir to a classical German philosophy. However, this statement is misleading. It would incline the reader to expect a treatment of classical German philosophy similar to what it receives from Engels and his orthodox Marxist followers. In fact, there are few important similarities. For Lucas returns not to Engels' interpretation of the heritage, but to deeper questions concerning Marx's relation to his philosophical forebears. Engels was the first to describe the broad sweep of the history of ideas from the French Enlightenment through Hegel and Feuerbach as an intellectual pro prolegomena to Marxism. However, his version of Marxism bore little resemblance to the heritage it assumed. He presented it as a natural philosophy, synthesizing the sciences into a materialist worldview. The final traces of classical German philosophy that remain were to be found in a revised dialectic that presumably continued the Hegelian theory of reality as process. But neither this materialist world worldview nor this version of the dialectic can carry the weight of the inheritance Engels claims for them. For Engels, the essence of the heritage is science, because only science is universal, not bound by the classic conditions on which it nevertheless depends for its birth. Although the bourgeoisie created modern natural science, it can no longer accept the truths its own sciences discover. Now new ideas undermine the foundations of its ideology, the static worldview and the post-festum religious conversion 
of a class menaced by the repercussions of its own rationalistic traditions. The proletariat alone needs the truth and it alone therefore can rise to the universal point of view required for the pursuit of truth in the period of the decadence of bourgeois society. Like Engels, Lucas too sees more at stake in the socialist movement than a change in property relations. The struggle will also decide the fate of reason itself. But both the rationalism and the irrationalism of bourgeois society now appear to Lucas to be infinitely more problematical than they appeared to earlier Marxists. Gone is the enlightenment optimism and faith in science of traditional Marxism. Gone its untroubled confidence in progress. For the first time, there arises within Marxism an interrogation of enlightenment itself, and not just of its limits or abuse in bourgeois society. Lucas's critique of reified rationality foreshadows the later work of Adorno and Horkheimer in their dialectic of enlightenment. Like them, Lucas sees in modern irrationalism not a mere regression behind the achieved level of rationality, but its dialectical correlate. He describes irrationalism as a reaction against reification under the horizon of reification itself. The heritage of classical German philosophy now appears in a very different light than it did to Engels, not as the salvation of the scientific debris of the enlightenment from an increasingly obscurantist bourgeoisie, but as a great attempt to validate and found rationality, an attempt that had inevitably to fail in its bourgeois form, but which the proletariat may yet bring off. For Lucas, bourgeois thought reaches its peak in classical German philosophy, but at the same time, its contradictions manifest themselves there with more clarity and rigor than elsewhere. Lucas sums up these contradictions as the antinomies of bourgeois thought, the split between subject and object, freedom and necessity, value and fact, form and content. Philosophy attempts to unite the poles of these antinomies in what Lucas calls a totality. For Lucas, as for Hegel, to transcend such ossified antithesis is the sole concern of reason. The resolution of the antinomies is the fundamental ex exigency of this philosophy through which it founds the concept of reason. Lucas considers Kant's philosophy to be the purest expression of these antinomies. The greatness of Hegel lies principally in having developed the dialectical methodology by which Kantianism could be subjected to a rigorous critique. But the antinomies emerge intact from bourgeois philosophy in spite of its most strenuous intellectual efforts. Marxism then appears as the completion of the Hegelian critique of Kant, a completion that requires a radical change in orientation, but which in essence prolongs Hegelian dialectics. Lucas's own contribution consists in the appropriation of Hegel's dialectical critique of Kant from within Marxism. From this standpoint, classical German philosophy takes on a wholly new importance for Marxism. It poses for the first time, if in a still relatively unconscious form, the fundamental problems that Marxism is called upon to solve. Lucas refuses either to attempt a speculative resolution of the antinomies of philosophy or to close his eyes to them in the naive self-certainty of science. The only possible reconciliation is the practical transcendence of the opposition between the antinomic terms at the level at which they arise. The procedure of Lucas's metacritique of classical German philosophy consists in identifying this level as social and discovering the traces of their social origin in the most abstract concepts of this philosophy. Bourgeois philosophy, Lucas says, is able to think the deepest and most fundamental problems of the development of bourgeois society through to the end. On the plane of philosophy and in thought, it is able to take all the paradoxes of its position to the point where the methodological necessity of going beyond this historical stage in mankind's development can at least be seen as a problem. Henceforth, the founding of a universal concept of reason is impossible without this historical progress. This historical progress has therefore become as such a demand of reason, as such a demand of reason.
The failure of classical German philosophy demonstrates that reason requires, on purely methodological grounds, a step beyond bourgeois society, beyond philosophical speculation into revolutionary practice. Philosophy and Practice Lucas's approach to the study of philosophy is disconcerting, for it asks us not to believe that philosophical abstractions are rooted in social life, but stranger still, to believe that the problems arising from these abstractions can be resolved in social life. This approach implies a question not ordinarily posed about philosophy, namely why it is philosophy. This question is easily answered by the usual Marxist theory of ideology according to which philosophy serves to justify capitalism. This version of Marxism dismisses speculation and demands a direct practical assault on the problems philosophy merely mystifies. Philistines, whether Marxist or bourgeois, have always imagined they can simply replace philosophy with the serious business of action in the world. Lucas's point is that the kind of problems that become the basis of philosophical reflection cannot be solved by unreflective practice, because they arise at the points where such practice fails, or still, or still more critically, at those points at which its very success raises further questions it knows not how to address. For Lucas, therefore, it is not any and every practice that might resolve philosophical problems, but only a very special kind of practice the nature of which he explains in history and class consciousness. One might ask then what it is about the type of practice prevalent in bourgeois society that generates the problems with which philosophy is concerned. This question should also be reformulated more precisely as follows. What is the inner limit on practice in bourgeois society preventing it from resolving practically the types of problems that then appear in philosophy as antinomies. What is there about this practice that is the source of problems that cannot even begin to resolve, which do not appear as practical problems at all, but rather as philosophical problems? Already these questions begin to indicate why instead of recommending an immediate turn to practice, Lucas offers a meta-critique of philosophy in the course of which everyday practice, too, is subjected to critical analysis. Reified thought arises from the practical confrontation of the individual and society. It is not confined to the bourgeoisie, but affects all classes in bourgeois society, including the proletariat. Not surprisingly, however, it is particularly suited to the life conditions of the bourgeoisie, which are essentially individualistic. Solidarity between members of the class has a very limited, primarily defensive, function. Their usual social and economic interactions are competitive and conflictual. Therefore, what the class creates in common as a class, it generally accomplishes unconsciously through mechanisms which work behind the backs of the individuals. Each capitalist is aware of the activity of the class as a whole, as something external which is subject to objective laws which it can only experience passively. These sociological considerations form the essential background to Lucas's meta-critique of philosophy. The antinomy of value, in fact, can serve here as an exemplary philosophical problem. Social reality is governed by a pitiless determinism, indifferent to the needs and values of the individual. Value stands opposed to fact, freedom to necessity. This correlation of inner freedom and outward necessity of subjective value and objective reality is the immediate theoretical consequence of a, practical, of a practice that refuses all solidarity, all conscious collective, afabung of the unintended consequences of individual actions. The isolated individual is condemned to accept the existing social reality, free only to take up one or another attitude toward it. The struggle of the individual with reified reality can play itself out in two complementary forms. The reified consciousness must also remain hopelessly trapped in the two extremes of crude empiricism and abstract utopianism. In the one case, consciousness becomes a completely passive observer, moving in obedience to laws which it can never control. 
In the other, it regards itself as a power which is able of its own subjective volition to master the essentially meaningless motion of objects. These two antinomic opposites reappear everywhere in reified theory, in an ethics of duty versus a psychology of adaptation, in the lawful course of history versus the role of great men and ideas, in environmental causes of behavior versus personal responsibility, and so on and so forth. For the individuals, the dilemma is painful and inescapable. They may accept the given reality as is and attempt to achieve a personally advantageous position within it. Freedom is now restricted to movement within the framework of the, ne of the necessary laws of existing reality. No attempt can be made to transform or alter this world and what must necessarily come to pass within it. Resistance only leads to defeat. However, the psychic costs of realism have also been calculated from Stendhal to the modern critiques of conformism, society as a market, indeed a racket in selfhood. The other horn of the dilemma is a utopian struggle to realize higher values in the world. The individuals may refuse the existing reality and stand on principle regardless of consequences. The subject is split in half, its substance divided between empirical needs and desires that can best be satisfied by conformity and the authentic selfhood that derives from moral law or some other trans transcendent source. This position, which Kant developed into a coherent ethical philosophy, is no, is no more successful than realism in resolving the antinomy of value and fact. An unyielding reality, mechanistic in the unfolding of its autonomous course, proves unresponsive to utopian aspirations that it threatens in the inner citadel of the self. Freedom, Lucas writes, is neither able to overcome the material necessity of the system of knowledge and the soullessness of the fatalistic laws of nature, nor is it able to give them any meaning. With this argument, Lucas arrives at a theory of alienation similar to that of the early Marx. He shows how, from the structure of everyday practice in capitalist society, the activity of man, his own labor, becomes something objective and independent of him, which is submitted to the alienated autonomy of the natural social laws. This is the core of the Marxian critique of capitalism, the demonstration that even at his most active, man remains object and not subject of events. The reified theory practice relation. So far, the discussion of Lucas's metacritique of philosophy has shown that, that the antinomies of practical reason can be derived from the structure of practical activity in capitalist society. This is not surprising since practical reason is inevitably close to actual practice in its concepts and problems. However, the parallel demonstration that the antinomies of pure reason, specifically the antinomy of subject and object, can also be derived from the same structure is more challenging. According to Lucas, the reified paradigm of knowledge is rooted in the practice of technical control that is the central project of the bourgeoisie from its origins as a class. More precisely, it is the universality of this project that distinguishes bourgeois thought. Pre-capitalist societies carved a narrow sphere of activity out of nature, frequently ascribing their power over this small, humanized enclave to divine intervention. Technical rationality was thus always bounded by another type of thinking, reflecting the feebleness of the human species and its limited understanding of the world. Never before the emergence of capitalism did human beings see their destiny as the total and integral domination of nature. In capitalist society, the ancient impotence and restraint gives way to an ambition to overcome every residue of uncontrolled nature, and this new project completely transforms the concept of reason. Corresponding to the gradual fulfillment of this ambition, there is an increasing extension of reification that, projected to the limit, would make it possible to control every aspect of existence through a quantitative representation of its existence or of its essence. The subject 
that is dialectically correlated with this concept of reality is an agent of individual technical practice. From this standpoint, the recognition of the inviolability of the impersonal, autonomous laws of reality is the very condition of the comprehension and domination of reality by the individual. Indeed, for reified thought, only a reality caught in such concepts can really be mastered by us. For this thought, the reified is the rational and therefore also the controllable. The theoretical validation of bourgeois society requires the demonstration that the entire universe is rational and controllable in principle. The demonstration at first consists in the construction of formally rational models of the universe that reveal it to be available for domination. Capitalism was thus accompanied by attempts to validate its project on the basis of rationalistic metaphysics and mathematical science. For reified thought, the domination of nature and that of the human species in, in general is only possible insofar as nature conforms to reason. What exists as reality in the outer world must also exist as reason in the subject. The salient characteristic of the whole epoch is the equation, which appears naive and dogmatic, of formal, mathematical, rational knowledge both with knowledge in general and also with our knowledge. What is produced by us in thought as rational knowledge must prove itself as universal and objective. The principles of an autonomous and free reason must be shown to correspond with the nature of things. This is the original significance of the concept of the identity of subject and object. Lucas points out that this rationalistic philosophy involves a curious reversal of perspectives. Practically, the subject stands in a contemplative relation to the world. It is on this condition that subjectivity can control its world under the horizon of reification. But theoretically, the subject claims to produce the world actively in thought. It is on this condition that reification appears as the essence of reality. Practical contemplation and theoretical activity encompass this basic antinomy of reified thought. Lucas summarizes the problem as follows. The contradiction that appears here between subjectivity and objectivity in modern rationalist formal systems, the conflict between their nature as systems produced by us and their fatalistic necessity as distant from and alien to man, is nothing but the logical and methodological formulation of the state of moder modern society. For, on the one hand, men are constantly smashing, replacing, and leaving behind them natural, irrational, and factical bonds, while, on the other hand, they erect around themselves in the reality they have created and produced by themselves a kind of second nature, the operation of which opposes opposes itself to them with exactly the same lawful necessity as was the case earlier on with the rational forces of nature. More exactly, the social relations which appear in this form. To them, their own social action, says Marx, takes the form of the action of objects, which rule the producers instead of being ruled by them. In capitalist society, then, the unmastered, alienated form of social life takes shape as the dictate no longer of irrational religious powers, nor even of human masters, but of scientific laws. Reified reason becomes an expression of this alienation. No sooner achieved in pure theory, the identity of subject and object limits practice, confronting the individuals with a second nature, the laws of which they are impotent to change. Reification's technical paradigm of, paradigm of subjectivity and objectivity presupposes an individual subject. The more or less unconscious collective practices in which capitalism really consists appear to reified thought to lie on the side of the object. What the individuals cannot consciously and individually accomplish is thus not accomplished at all, but rather suffered by them as a fate. Of course, the individuals do relate to the products of these unconscious activities, but not as to human products. Rather, all they perceive of the collective practice in which they are engaged is its results, and behind these, its form imprinted on their objects. This form appears as an impersonal and autonomous law 
that pre-exists and predetermines social behavior. Lucas argues that it is only insofar as the object has been actively submitted to this form that it enters the circuit of capitalist technical domination. Thus, priority would go to history in explaining social laws and not vice versa. Reified thought fails to see that social practice is the ground of reification. Instead, it believes that the result of reification, the construction of objects as technically manipulable, reveals their pre-existing essence. For reified thought, this essence is precisely that dimension of the object through which power over it can be achieved. The reified object surrenders its own vital mechanism to control or to human control. Revealing its truth as a potentiality for manipulation that has always slumbered within it, Lucas's point once again is that this way of representing the subject-object relation reverses the picture by occluding the unconscious social practice that prepares the object for instrumental manipulation, both materially and through the work of social signification, in which it takes on a lawful form. Reified practice is the basis of the antinomy of subject and object and the other antinomies of philosophy. These antinomies arise because the reified subject of practice treats the product of its combined action with other similar subjects as a law governed objective reality. It is the unconscious of their collective social practice that condemns these subjects to actively reproduce a world foreign to themselves and to their aims. Philosophy conceptualizes the reified form of objectivity of the objects of this practice. It cannot recognize its own limits because it treats the most general consequences of a historical situation in which decision-making processes are separate as a metaphysical reality. In grasping these consequences as a law, it hypostasizes ontologically what is in reality due to a specific type of character or, or type of practice, sorry. If philosophy arises from reification and reification itself arises from the unconscious of social practice, then could one not imagine a unique kind of action that would consist in bringing this social practice to consciousness and thereby changing the conditions of philosophy or philosophical reflection? May it not be possible to de-reify the world, dissolving the social basis of the philosophical antinomies, simply by becoming aware of the unintended consequences of one's actions, bringing these consequences within the domain of social choice? This would be another basis for control of objects, not individual manipulation in conformity with laws, but conscious collective decision about the laws themselves. Lucas suggests, following Marx, that the individuals might come together under certain objective conditions to make such decisions, thereby interrupting the feedback mechanism that chains them to their perpetual reproduction of their alienated condition. This is Lucas's explanation of the Marxian idea of socialism as human control of history. Here, Here, theory as consciousness of reality would become a practical act with real effects and would no longer be comprehensible on reified terms as value-free contemplation of reality from a mythic epistemological beyond. As Horkheimer puts a similar point, in genuinely critical thought, explanation signifies not only a logical process but a concrete historical one as well. In the course of it, both the social structure as a whole and the relation of the theoretician to society are altered. That is, both the subject and the role of thought are changed. This conclusion describes Lucas's agenda in the historical analysis of classical German philosophy. From Kant to Hegel. At the center of history and class consciousness is a is an extraordinary discussion of the development from Kant to Hegel seen as steps in the intellectual progression leading to Marxism.
That progression is explained as the gradual working out of Kant's original intuition in ever more concrete, ever more adequate forms, culminating in the final recognition of the social practice behind the reified appearance. In the course of this discussion, Lucas shows that Marxism is the veritable Aufbung of classical German philosophy, arising from its inner dynamic on the basis of its results. Lucas's argument in the second part of the essay on reification is presented as a quasi-history behind which it is possible to identify a static model that in fact organizes his presentation. This model is the Kantian system with its threefold division into critiques of pure reason, practical reason, and judgment. The history of classical German philosophy, as Lucas presents it, is in fact the successive thematization of each of these three aspects of Kantian doctrine, qua solution to the antinomies. This analysis yields three demands of reason that must be fulfilled to overcome reified thought. They are one, the principle of practice, two, dialectical method, three, history as reality. In this section and the next, I will attempt to explain the response of classical German philosophy to these demands. As one attempt after another to fulfill them fails, the emphasis shifts, culminating finally in Marxism. All along the way, Lucas draws out the implicit conclusions established by this philosophical experience, conclusions that later form the basis of a new concept of reason. Lucas's conception of reified society as a second nature, the laws of which are created by human beings, but which appear as natural laws, suggests an important philosophical parallel. This is, after all, approximately the form of the Kantian theory of knowledge, the notion that experience is governed by laws imposed on it by the subject, which in turn necessarily determine the knowledge of the subject. What is the significance of this parallel? Lucas seeks the answer to this question in a metacritique of Kant's famous Copernican revolution. Note that metacritique is not ideology, ideology critique. Rather, Kant's theory is a rational way of understanding reified social reality under its horizon, that is to say, as it appears to reified thought. More precisely, this means that when Kant founds the identity of our knowledge and objectivity in the concept of transcendental synth synthesis, he is not merely masking, but rather explaining the very same social reality Lucas also explains. It was thus Kant, in a sense, who first discovered the process of reification, but only insofar as it can be understood speculatively as the result of an imaginary individual practice. Kant's philosophy is an enormous theoretical advance over earlier rationalism that simply assume the rationality of the universe without suspecting the constitutive function of the subject. Where earlier philosophy had, for the most part, taken for granted the objectivity of objects and the immediacy of experience, Kant shows that objectivity is the product of a synthesis performed by the subject on the raw materials of experience through the imposition of forms of objectivity such as space, time, and causality. The synthesis of experience consists in its submission to these forms without which it would not take shape as a coherent world of objects at all. This was Kant's Copernican revolution, which placed the subject at the center of the epistemological universe where formerly the object held sway. But this revolution had a surprising consequence. Recognizing the role of mental activity and perception gave rise to the notion of the thing in itself. Kant's successors focused on overcoming this paradoxically unknowable reality. Lucas's interpretation of this problematic is quite unusual. Instead of regarding the thing in itself as beyond experience, he explains it in terms of the form-content distinction he found in the work of Emil Lask. 
Recall that the Neocantians distinguished between the realm of nature to which general laws applied and history, which was said to be made up of unique events. These phenomena were considered irrational insofar as they resisted explanation through law. They constituted a kind of intra-experiential thing in itself. Lask's contribution was situated in this context. He argued that the thing in itself should not be conceived as unknowable, nor as an exclusively historical phenomenon, but rather in terms of the relation of meaning or formed content in experience. Meanings apply to a meaningless material, for example, the stuff of sensation which now stands in for the thing in itself in Lucas's appropriation of Lask. This shifts the emphasis away from the epistemological problem of how the mind produces representations in various fields. Instead, Lask focuses on the ontological question of meaning as a necessary feature of experience. Lucas applies these concepts in his interpretation of Kant and his successors. He describes their challenge as explaining meaning in such a way as to demonstrate that it actually penetrates its content and shapes it to the core. Only thus would it be possible to prove that reality is not fundamentally meaningless. Subject-object identity thus does not erase the factual independence of reality, but rather comprehends reality through and through. Identity signifies that reason can produce its objects in this special sense in theory and practice. But Lucas argues classical German philosophy is torn by the conflict of two principles. On the one hand, it demands that rationality overcome the contingency, the merely factical givenness of objects. This is the condition for founding a universal rationalism unbounded by supernatural mysteries or unknowable realities. On the other hand, it assumes a reified, formalistic concept of reason that secretes contingency and facticity as the residue of the process of abstraction from concrete content in which rationality consists. Such a formalistic concept of reason can never unite fully with its objects. Thus, in Kant's critique of pure reason, reified thought encounters the insurmountable contradiction between its ambition to produce its objects in thought by deducing them from their forms and the impossibility of embracing the content of these forms with a formalistic concept of reason. Earlier, dog earlier dogmatic metaphysics had not even recognized the problem. Lucas argues, it is evident that this principle of systematization of rationalism is not reconcilable with the recognition of any reality in content, which in principle cannot be deduced from the principle of form, and which therefore has simply to be accepted as a facticity. Kant's thought is truly critical with respect to dogmatic rationalism to the extent that it recognizes the insuperable antinomy of form and content for a formalistic concept of reason. Finite understanding requires a material substratum of irreducibly contingent facts. With this, with this, the very notion of building a philosophical system on the model of mathematics collapses. Kant argues the pure reason is unable to make the last leap toward the synthesis and the constitution of an object, and so its principles cannot be deduced directly from concepts but only indirectly by relating these concepts to something wholly contingent, namely possible experience. Because this possible experience cannot be produced by, this sub by the subject, a rationality in the form of the thing in itself invades the terrain on which the traditional rationalist systems were constructed. But Kant is an uncritical and dogmatic as it but Kant is as uncritical and dogmatic as his predecessors in assuming that rationality is essentially formalistic. As we will see, Lucas regards the principle of identity as necessary for any consistent rationalism, including Marxism. But he argues that the reified paradigm of formal knowledge is tied specifically to capitalist society.
It is precisely because Kant both accepts reification and criticizes artificial solutions to the problems it raises that he is driven beyond the limits of earlier philosophy. Once the unity of reified thought and reality has been undermined, maintaining a concept of reason capable of producing its objects is only possible beyond the horizon of pure theory. The methodological validation of the power of reason must take place in another region of human existence. Thus, Kant was led to pose the fundamental demand of reason that preoccupied classical German philosophy thereafter, and led eventually to Hegel's dialectic. The exigency of a subject of thought which could be thought of as producing existence without any hiatus, irrationalis, or transcendental thing in itself. Kant attempts to discover a level of reality at which the duality of subject and object is transcended, and starting out from which their empirical duality can be deduced. This exig exigency, in turn, can only be satisfied by abandoning the contemplative point of view, and discovering a practical subject that, in generating its own world of objects, transcends the rigid dichotomy of form and content. This new orientation toward practice is motivated by the desire to find a subject, the object of which is integrally and fully its own product, Lucas explains. The very moment when this situation, i.e. when the indissoluble links that bind the contemplative attitude of the subject to the purely formal character of the object of knowledge becomes conscious. It is inevitable either that the attempt to find a solution to the problem of rationality, the question of content of the given, etc., should be abandoned or that it should be sought in practice. <clears throat> Responding to this dilemma, Kant turned from epistemology to ethics, from the thinking of the acting or from the thinking to the acting subject to find the identical subject object. Ethical action seems to transcend the empirical duality of subject and object. No merely given facticity, resistant to subjectivity and independent of it appears to trouble the production of ethical substance. However, the ethical subject still confronts the reified reality described in the critique of pure reason. Its practice encounters a world in which laws still operate with inexorable necessity. As we have seen in an earlier discussion of the value fact in Tinomy, the subject divides into an empirical self, given over to the laws of this world, and a transcendental self, free to obey the ethical law. The ethical act assumes a phenomenal form determined by the laws of the world just like any other thing. It is perfectly integrated into the course of outer determinism, and thus there is a sense in which no value enters experience through it. Rather, in passing from an intention of the will into the positive form of objective behavior, the higher values seem to be irretrievably lost. Only the inner form of the act in the mind of the actor distinguishes it from a non-ethical act. Only the disposition of the will of the actor and not the act itself is ethical in essence. Lucas sums up this dilemma. For precisely in the pure classical expression it received in the philosophy of Kant, it remains true that the ought presupposes a being to which the category of ought remains inapplicable in principle. Ethical practice does not successfully fulfill its function in the system. All ethics can show is the point where the real interpenetration of form and content should begin, where it would begin if its formal rationality could allow it to do more than predict formal possibilities in terms of formal calculations. The actual identity of subject and object in the ethical act remains an unknowable thing in itself transcending experience. The ethical solution to the cognitive form content problem has merely reproduced its terms. Kant fails to discover what Lucas calls the principle of practice, the essence of which consists in annulling that indifference of form toward content that we found in the problem of the thing in itself. The principle of practice requires the transcendence of the theoretical orientation toward, rational, or toward reality, 
and a practice that is tailored to the concrete material substratum of action in order to impinge upon it to some effect. Nevertheless, can't move beyond knowledge toward practice opens the way to solutions his successors elaborated. Kant's aesthetics provides the starting point for these attempts. It includes the concept of the creation of a concrete totality that springs from a consumption of form, conception of form oriented toward the concrete content of its material substratum. Kant develops this idea in terms of a hypothetical, intuitive understanding that would transcend the gap between concept and sense intuition by actually creating the objects of its knowledge. He contrasts this intuitive understanding with human reason as follows. In fact, our understanding has the property of proceeding in its cognition from the analytical universal concepts to the particular given empirical intuition. Thus, as regards the manifold of the latter, it determines nothing, but must await this determination by the judgment of the subsumption of the empirical intuition under the concept. We can, however, think we can, however, think an understanding which being not like ours, discursive, but intuitive proceeds from the synthetical universal, the intuition of whole as such, to the particular, i.e. from the whole to the parts. The contingency of the combination of the parts in order that a definite form of the whole shall be possible is not implied by such an understanding in its representation of the whole. The intuitive understanding is not a theoretical subject and capable of penetrating the content of its objects. On the contrary, it synthesizes theory and practice. Its content is not given, but created. The intuitive understanding is, in Kant's words, spontaneous, i.e. active and not receptive, i.e. contemplative, both as regards knowledge and intuitive perception. Adumbrated in this concept is the speculative notion of the practical production of reality that so influences later thinkers. While Kant himself did not so employ it, his successors, notably Schiller and Fichte, believed it could resolve the antinomies of philosophy. According to Lucas, German philosophy after Kant used the concept of an intuitive understanding to radicalize Kant's epistemological revolution. The subject was to play the chief role not only in epistemology, but in ontology as well, by constituting not only the forms of knowledge, but also the content. The thing in itself, which for Kant lay irrevocably beyond knowledge, the Kantian concept of synthesis is thus transformed into a metaphysical principle of world constitution. In Schiller, the problem of the production of objective reality in thought is approached through a new problem of a similar type that arises in relation to the subject. Both the philosophical and the real social development increasingly fragment the subject into opposed faculties that no longer form a unity. The rigid specializations of bourgeois social life penetrate the subject and interrupt communication between the different aspects of the self. The comprehension of the totality can no longer proceed through the deduction of reality from the subject, a task the limits of which have been revealed by Kant. Instead, Schiller proposes the deduction of the unity of the subject as a whole from the aesthetic subject, operating as an intuitive understanding in the perception creation of itself. The aesthetic subject cannot reconcile the faculties of the mind without being generalized beyond the sphere of artistic production. This Schiller does in his theories of the instinct of play and aesthetic education. The aesthetic principle then reconciles all the contraries of human nature, both in theory and practice, and shows the way back to a unified and total humanity. But this attempt to employ a non-formalistic, intuitive understanding modeled on aesthetic practice is unsuccessful. Outside the sphere of actual artistic production, it ceases to be a true subject of practice. Schiller generalizes it by taking up an aesthetic attitude toward the existing world, 
an attitude that reproduces the world in thought as a finished work of art, in this way apparently overcoming its reified facticity. But here, the action of the subject is reduced to yet another form of contemplation, not calculating reason, but aesthetic appreciation. Ficht, who also attempts to construct a new concept of reason on the basis of the intuitive understanding, transforms it into a transcendental faculty of the mind from which proceeds the empirical subject and the entire existing world. Now philosophy turns now now philosophy turns not toward an attitude, as with Schiller, but toward a renewal of speculative metaphysics. But this position too falls short of practice. I lost my spot. The activity that was to unite the faculties subject and object, form and content, turns out to be no more than another form of contemplation, a speculative mythology. In one important respect, however, Schiller and Fichte do represent an advance over Kant. Although they know more than he discovered the true principle of practice, they finally challenged the dogmatic assumption the formalistic knowledge is the only kind of knowledge. With Hegel, this challenge is brought to fruition in dialectics. His unique contribution is the historical approach to overcoming the irrationality of the contents of knowledge. <clears throat> he attempts to embrace the material substratum of thought through dialectics to create a logic of the concrete concept a logic of the totality. Hegel's historical dialectic. Hegel realizes that the principle of practice cannot be fulfilled starting out from the individual subject and a formalistic paradigm of knowledge. The dialectical unification of subject and object requires a subject that is also an object. A subject commensurate with the reality it knows this is the demand that the subject to subs This is the demand that the subject be substance. Lucas explains only if the subject, consciousness, thought, were both producer and product of the dialectical process, only if, as a result, the subject moved in a self created world of which it is the conscious form and only if the world imposed itself upon it in full objectivity, only then can the problem of dialectics and with it the abolition of the antitheses of subject and object, thought and existence, freedom and necessity be held to be solved. In sum, the antinomies must be resolved not by a mythologized transcendental subject modeled on the individual, but by a principle imminent to the world. To establish that principle, Hegel takes the Kantian construction of the subject-object relation and shatters its ontological basis in the traditional concepts of subject and object, which Kant and his followers presupposed. If thought and things are no longer defined as ontologically independent domains of being, in what form can they be grasped? Hegel proceeds to release the correlated attributes of subjectivity and objectivity from the reification in the hypostasized individual subject and object. Once released from the grip of their traditional ontological base, the attributes of thought and things are thematized in new combinations in a dialectical ontology. In this ontology, Functions of the subject, such as reflection, appearance, synthesis, and abstract form, are transferred to the real, where they organize its dialectical movement. As Marcuse puts it, formulated paradoxically, human consciousness does not grasp objectivity, not even in its transcendental form. Rather, conceiving is the doing and essence of objectivity itself.
conceptual activity and human concepts can be true and reach the essence of objectivity only because conceptual activity constitutes the essence of objectivity. The traditional subject and object no longer appear in antinomic opposition, but are now derived from a more basic unity. Hegel was thus finally able to discover a way of uniting form and content, the rational categories of philosophy and their material substratum. This is the significance of the dialectic. In contrast with the formalistic notion of explanation through classification under un or under universal concepts, dialectical mediation unfolds the implicit meaning of its immediate starting point. In a sense, then, the immediate is always already mediated, if only inarticulately. There are no things in themselves, sense data, or other pre-conceptual identity or entities that are given form for the first time by thought since the essential element in which thought moves, meaning, is already implicit in its material presupposition. In Hegel, the object of knowledge is neither an inert, unreflected substance, nor is it created by a transcendental subject. As Robert Pippin shows, Hegel's project radicalizes critical philosophy's attempt at reason's reliance on itself alone in accounting for experience, or evaluating action, but it attempts to do so by avoiding or denying any assumption that such self-determination should be understood as imposing itself on a foreign manifold or object. Whatever comes to count as a constraint or limit on thought's self-determination is itself viewed as a kind of product or result, a higher or more comprehensive level of thought's self-determination. Given this approach, the system cannot be ex expo exposited more geometrical because it depends on a process. That process is a mediation rather than a demonstration. It is narrated rather than deduced. History is the ontological region uniquely suited to such a process of mediation. In history, the alterity of the object is time-bound rather than metaphysical. Time belongs to the unfolding process of meaning-making. It separates the implicit from the explicit meaning and the gap between them is overcome in time. Thus, Hegel treats history as reality, as ontologically fundamental. Hegel's turn toward history marks a sharp break with rationalism. Rationalism finds in history its least suitable object because history involves newness and qualitative change. Formal reason can only grasp history in terms of a system of foreseeable possibilities derived from abstract atemporal laws. But history, as a process of concrete becoming, escapes it. By contrast, history is the ideal object of dialectics. It embodies a type of, of objectivity that lends itself to explanation in terms of a non-formalistic concept of reason. But, Lucas argues, for history to provide a solution to the problems of classical German philosophy, it would be necessary to discover the subject of history not only speculatively, but in fact to find the real we, whose action is history. Hegel's version of the historical subject is the spirit of peoples, but peoples do not understand the significance of their own action. They are not conscious of the truth of their deeds, which can only be comprehended once completed, once history has passed on to a new stage, and the past is delivered over to philosophical reflection. A mediation that transcends history stands between the activity of the historical subject and the meaning of its acts. Hegel conceptualizes this mediation as a second collective subject. The world spirit, which uses the spirit of the peoples to attain ends the latter does not understand. Hence the phrase cunning of reason. Lucas concludes that Hegel's subject of history can never claim its acts as its own. It is not the master of its own process, the subject as substance that, in achieving self-consciousness, transcends the antinomies of reified thought in the theoretical and practical transformation of reality. History itself never achieves self-consciousness. 
Only the world's spirit can accomplish this as it comes to self-awareness in the head of the philosopher at the end of history. Reason thus fulfills itself in history only by transcending history. As a result, history is not able to form the living body of the total system. It becomes a part, an aspect of the totality that culminates in the absolute spirit, in art, religion, and philosophy. But history is much too much the natural and indeed the uniquely possible life element of the dialectical method for such an enterprise to succeed. This, according to Lucas, explains why Hegel is obliged to confront the antinomies, antinomies of classical German philosophy outside of history in the realm of absolute spirit. As soon as dialectics deploys itself in that timeless realm, the problems of form and content arise once again. The dialectical categories continue to develop in the theory of absolute spirit and in pure logic, but as eternal forms detach from the real becoming of the world. This dialectical process is purely ideal, no longer corresponding to the real time of historical action. Hegel's work is the culmination of classical German philosophy, drawing the logical conclusions from its various experiments and discoveries. In spite of his limitations, Hegel did discover two essential conditions of the principle of practice, the dialectic and the special affinity of dialectics for history. However, until the actual subject of this practice is also discovered, reason cannot be founded rationally. This, Lucas believes, awaited the Marxist theory of history. Marxism arises directly on the soil of the Hegelian system, but informed by a far deeper insight into the empirical stuff of history. In Marxism, the speculative character of the Hegelian approach is finally overcome in a correct understanding of history. In this sense, Marx's critique of Hegel is the direct continuation and extension of the criticism that Hegel himself leveled at Kant and Fichte. The Principle of Practice Lucas's discussion of Hegel completes his venture into philosophical experience. It demonstrates that classical German philosophy cannot fulfill the requirements of its own principle of, of practice. The practical contradictions arising objectively from capitalist reification between individual and social law, between this law itself and the content that it determines, between, in short, the historical subject and object, cannot be transcended from within reification. Instead, reified thought produces more and more complex speculative mediations uniting the antinomic opposites. Mediations that are pure mental constructions. Lucas calls this conceptual mythology, i.e. the failure to understand a fundamental condition of human existence, one whose effects cannot be warded off. Even where this philosophy strives hardest to base itself on a practical principle, it remains in a contemplative attitude because it can offer no real challenge to the fixed and finished character of the capitalist world. Its very concepts of subject and object, of thought and being, express the rigid oppositions of this world. Objectivity can only be united with subjectivity in a speculative manner, because no real practical unity can be conceived in the untranscended framework of capitalist society. As Lucas writes, but how to prove this identity in thought and being of the ultimate substance, above all when it has been shown that they are completely heterogeneous in the way in which they present themselves to the intuitive, contemplative attitude. Nevertheless, Lucas concludes, within these limits, classical German philosophy does succeed in indicating the direction in which a solution to its problems can be found. What Lucas calls the grandiose conception that thought can only grasp what it has self-created leads to the demand to master the world as a whole by seeing it as self-created. This ambition is frustrated by the contingency of content as we have seen. The response of classical German philosophy to this problem was the search for a type of practice giving access to that content. This practice would not presuppose reification as its horizon, 
but would transcend this horizon and change reality itself. But the search fails because the philosophers attempt to go beyond reification theoretically through resolving its contradictions in thought. The thing in itself inevitably confronts the subject of science and technology. Ethics, aesthetics, and the wisdom of the philosopher at the end of history all suffer from an implicit acceptance of reified reality, toward which they adopt an attitude rather than effecting a change. At every stage, one dimension of reified thought is surmounted from the point of view of another. Theoretical contemplation by ethical practice, ethics by aesthetics, formal rationality by dialectic cutoff, and the last analysis from history. And precisely because the higher level from which the lower is deduced is itself reified, the original problems of the lower level simply reappear at the higher one in new forms. The principle of practice not only requires a move beyond theory, it also requires a type of practice that affects reality as a whole and not just marginal aspects of it. Artistic practice, to give a counter illustration, fails because it has so little impact on the social world that is founding for it. What is needed is a practice that is total in, that, in the sense that it is unbounded by a dimension of reality it cannot alter, and that therefore persists as a reified residuum, or res, res, residuum, a thing in itself. History remains as the only domain in which to find a practice that can affect not only superficial traits of reality, but the very essence of the phenomena. Since, unlike nature, history is the product of human action, it is conceivable that here self-change could be an objective change in reality, as the principle of practice requires. Furthermore, History is not a mere sector among others, but is the primary and basic reality. All other subject-object relations can be derived from that of the historical subject. An object and interpreted through their historical dimension. Lucas takes Hegel himself as the demonstration in contrario of this claim. For the unhistorical residue remaining in Hegel's system becomes the point at which the reified subject-object relation is reintroduced. But the practical production of reality is no Heraclitian flux. The study of history must explain the relation between the événementiel and institutions, practices, and culture. Lucas formulates this requirement as the coincidence of historical action and the structuring of experience through the imposition of a form of objectivity. The process of synthesis of the real, its logical genesis at the level of the categories, must be identical with the practical production of social reality by its subject. Then form and content, philosophy and reality can be united and the antinomies that emerge in the Kantian system finally overcome. As Lucas explains it, to go beyond immediacy can only mean the genesis, the production of the object, but this assumes that the forms of mediation in and through which it becomes possible to go beyond the immediate existence of objects as they are given can be shown to be the structural principles of construction and the real tendencies of the movement of the objects themselves that therefore intellectual genesis must be identical in principle with historical genesis. With this rather puzzling methodological requirement, Lucas wants to avoid two correlated errors, either explaining history in terms of non-historical categories or abandoning historical explanation in the face of the irrationality of individual events. <clears throat> Between these extremes, between these extremes lies a type of explanation that draws its categories from the events. As Rockmore explains, Lucas's approach is an effort to reconcile a categorical perspective that denies the, su the sufficiency of immediate intuitive experience with an insistence that the categories emerge directly out of experience. In sum, the world is not merely there in its facticity, 
nor is it literally manufactured by the proletariat. The world, and this includes the proletariat, is bursting out of its reified form of objectivity. The violent actions in which that explosion consists realize the objective tendencies Marx identified. In so doing, those acts also construct a new social world that alters the functional relation of the elements of society. The acts in which the revolutionary proletariat shatters its reified form of objectivity open up a new way of being in the world, a new realm of meaning, and thus the structures of meaning inherited from capitalism are transformed and made adequate to the life process they form. The indifference of form toward content is overcome. Lucas argues that the antinomies of value and fact, knowledge and reality would finally be resolved for a self-conscious collective subject of history. <coughs> Sorry. It would unite theory and practice. Its self-understanding would have immediate repercussions on its behavior. Abolishing the gap between mind and matter and creating a new type of practice different from reified technical practice. The contemplative limits of the traditional philosophical subject would be transcended, as would the rigid opposition of subject and object, value and fact. In knowing, this subject would be producing the object of its knowledge, or more precisely, changing its form of objectivity by overcoming its own immediacy. This would be a Kantian intuitive understanding based not on a mythic principle, a transcendental ego or a hypothetical god, but on actual finite subjects in the world. This is what it really means to claim that the proletariat is the legitimate heir of the idealist program. Mediation. Marx describes the historical tendencies leading to socialism emerging within the capitalist economy as tensions, breakdowns, crises. These crises reveal the limits of reification not only as a social form, but as a form of rationality. The, transcendent, the, transcend, the transcendence of capitalism in socialist revolution is also the transcendence of its philosophical limit, limits, the resolution of the antinomies. For Lucas, as for the early Marx, revolution is method, the solution to the antinomies of bourgeois thought. Lucas works out the implications of this position in the third part of the reification essay, but the argument is developed in scattered passages that omit important themes and problems. He explains the historical mediation of social forms by their contents, but he fails to apply the concept of mediation to the antinomy of society and nature. Instead, he offers bold statements claiming that the proletariat is the identical subject-object, this makes for several confusing ambiguities I will examine in more detail in the remainder of this chapter and the next. In brief, it is unclear if the identical subject-object is a particular entity, the proletariat as a class, or a process of mediation engaging the whole society, in which the proletariat plays an essential role. In the former case, there is little to be said in defense of the theory today. In fact, this is a commonplace interpretation. Lucas is supposed to have described the proletariat as a kind of romantic subjectivity writ large. This interpretation, which I will call metaphysical, makes of him a voluntarist in relation to society and a subjective idealist in relation to nature. Here is an example of the sort of lyrical passage that seems to confirm this image of Lucas. Man must be able to comprehend the present as a becoming. He can do this by seeing in it the tendencies out of whose dialectical opposition he can make the future. Only when he does this will the present be a process of becoming that belongs to him. Only he who is willing and whose mission it is to create the future can see the present in its concrete truth. As Hegel says, truth is not to treat objects as alien. The alternative interpretation of subject-object identity as a process of mediation belongs to a theory of dialectical rationality. This theory has suggestive implications for us, even though our context is very different from that of Lucas in the early 1920s.
Mediation has not disappeared along with the revol revolutionary proletarian movement, but has simply changed purpose and form. The important point is that mediation is a process, not a thing. The continuation of the passage quoted above confirms this interpretation. Lucas goes on. Thus thought and existence are not identical in the sense that they correspond to each other or coincide with each other, all expressions that conceal a rigid duality. Their identity is that they are aspects of one and the same real historical and dialectical process. What is reflected in the consciousness of the proletariat is the new positive reality arising out of the dialectical contradictions of capitalism. And this is by no means the invention of the proletariat, nor was it created out of the void. It is rather the inevitable consequence of the process in its totality, one which changed from being an abstract possibility to a concrete reality only after it had become part of the consciousness of the proletariat and had been made practical by it. And this is no mere formal transformation, for a possibility to be realized, for a tendency to become actual, what is required is the objective overthrow of society, the transformation of the function of its moments, and with them the structure and content of every individual object. What is happening in these passages? Here Lucas condenses two radically different discourses, the idealist discourse of classical German philosophy and the Marxist critique of political economy. The performative power of thought drawn from the one discourse is joined to the concept of economic evolution of the other. Simply put, history moves forward through the realization of its objective tendencies, but the tendencies can only be realized when they are seized and appropriated by consciousness. Has Marxism ever said anything else? But in Lucas's version of this thesis, something new is implied, for the concept of mediation implicates the fate of reason in social theory. Here I will review some of the passages in which Lucas explains the concept of mediation underlying his theory of dialectical rationality. They are of more than historical interest. If we abstract from certain Marxist references more relevant in 1923 than today, they suggest a dialectic of reification and resistance, structure and agency. Anticipating my conclusion, I will argue that the notion of mediation supports a non-essentialist interpretation of the role of the proletariat in the resolution of the antinomies. In the remainder of this section, I will focus on five passages that reveal the implications of Lucas's theory. One. One. The proletariat cannot create a new society ex nihilo, but must start out from the capitalist heritage. The transcendent, the trans, fuck, I hate this word, the transcendence of reification and proletarian class consciousness implies no epistemological withdrawal to a free cogito, to a pure undetermined ground. Its precondition is capitalist society itself, its culture, its forms of thought that can only be transcended through a reflection in which they are criticized and comprehended historically. Reification is the foundation of true knowledge of society precisely insofar as it is relativized dialectically. Proletarian thought does not require a tabula rasa, a new start to the task of comprehending reality and one without any preconceptions, but conceives of bourgeois society together with its intellectual and artistic productions as the point of departure for its own method. It implies that the falseness and the one-sidedness of the bourgeois view of history must be seen as a necessary factor in the systematic acquisition of knowledge about society. Why? Because it is just in this bourgeois objectification, rationalization, and reification of all social forms that we see clearly for the first time how society is constructed from the relations of men with each other. Where pre-capitalist societies saw the work of God, capitalist societies recognize the human hand, if in an alienated form. This explains why Marxist economic theory is a critique rather than a positive statement free of reference to error. 2. The proletariat is the subject of history, but it is not an idealist subject. 
It is determined as much as determining and cannot freely create a world after its own designs. It is true that the proletariat is the conscious subject of total social reality, but the conscious subject is not defined here as in Kant, where subject is defined as that which can never be an object. The subject here is not a detached spectator of the process. The proletariat is more than just the active and passive part of this process. The rise and evolution of its knowledge and its actual rise and evolution in the course of history are just the two different sides of the same real process. Lucas further clarifies this proposition, writing that the identity of thought and existence means not that the subject creates the object, but that they are aspects of one in the same real historical and dialectical process. 3. History must be explained through human action, but human action itself is as much product as producer of history. Man has become the measure of all societal things, and the understanding of history consists in the der derivation of the indissoluble fetishistic forms from the primary forms of human relations. Man is the measure, specifically in opposition to all attempts to measure history from above or outside of history, i.e. from a god, nature, or transhistorical laws conceived as founding for history. Yet this is no humanism in the sense of a doctrine that would derive history from a prior concept of man, or from a quasi-theological creative power attributed to the human species. For if man is made the measure of all things, and if with the aid of that assumption all transcendence is to be eliminated without applying the same standard to himself, or more exactly, without making man himself dialectical, then man himself is made into an absolute and he simply puts himself in the place of those transcendental forces he was supposed to explain, dissolve, and systematically replace. 4. Lucas develops this argument further in a passage that shows that the transcendent transcendence of the antinomies is not a one-sided predominance of the subject. The dialectical process, the ending of a rigid confrontation of rigid forms, is enacted essentially between the subject and the object. Only if the relativizing or the inter interpenetration of the subject and the object themselves, only if the true were understood not only as substance but also as subject, only if the subject, consciousness, thought were both producer and product of the dialectical process, and if as a result the subject moved in a self-created world of which it is the conscious form, and only if the world imposed itself upon it in full objectivity, only then can the problem of dialectics and with it the abolition of the antitheses of subject and object, thought and existence, freedom and necessity be held to be solved. Lucas's rejection of the voluntaristic notion of the proletariat as a free agent overcoming all structure comes through clearly in these passages. Instead, he affirms that the proletariat is objectively structured and that only as such is it an agent of structural transformation. Its objectivity is the condition of its subjectivity while also limiting its agency. 5. This position seems incompatible with the notion that reification characterizes only the bourgeois era and can be wholly eliminated under socialism. Given, <coughs> given the dialectic of reification and mediation, the elimination of the former would eliminate the latter. Insofar as the truth is discovered dialectically, reification is a necessary moment in the process of discovery. Reification is, in sum, not the opposite of dialectics, but a moment in it. Nevertheless, the position of the reified moment in the totality may change in the course of history. Lucas himself says something like this in a passage that shows he was aware of the danger of a utopian interpretation of his theory. At the same time, it is clear that from the standpoint of the proletariat, the empirically given reality of the objects does dissolve into processes and tendencies. This process is no single, unrepeatable tearing of the veil that masks the process, but the unbroken alternation of ossification, contradiction, and movement, and thus the proletariat represents the true reality, namely the tendencies of history awakening into consciousness. <clears throat> Again, Lucas concedes 
that even the proletariat can only overcome reification as long as it is oriented toward practice. And this means that there can be no single act that will eliminate reification in all its forms at one blow. It means that there will be a whole host of objects that at least in appearance remain more or less unaffected by the process. This is true in the first instance of nature. It will come back to this reservation concerning nature in the next chapter. Konstantinos Kavulakos reasonably asks, how identical is then the subject object of history, which is pervaded by internal ruptures, by internal divisions that impel it to a constantly renewed search for its identity? We should rather think of it ultimately as an open process rather than as the completion of the Hegelian absolute spirit. These remarks are anticipated by Marcus in an early text in which he credits Siegfried Mark with having put to an end the primitive critique according to which Lucas's analysis can be refuted by calling it a metaphysics. <clears throat> the dialectic of reification. Out of these scattered passages, a theory emerges that Lucas himself did not articulate in a coherent fashion. This theory helps us to understand how he could have believed his position was truly dialectical rather than a replay of the old transcendental tune or regressive return to Gemeinschaft. It gains in plausibility to the extent that it deflates his rhetorical appeal to the creative power of the subject. But the dialectic seems to concern only society. The theory does not directly address the ontological issues raised by the critique of classical German philosophy. Furthermore, it has implications that do not square easily with Marxism. Because he relates reification to commodity fetishism, Lucas cannot admit that it persists under socialism in principle rather than as vestige. He makes a similar assumption concerning bureaucracy, law, and technology, all of which are reified under capitalism and presumed to be de-reified de under socialism. But this seems to leave socialism without an institutional structure, a conclusion Lucas nowhere reaches. So what is his alternative? One sees him attempting to find the alternative in a passage in which he remarks that the world which confronts man in theory and in practice exhibits a kind of objectivity which, if properly thought out and understood, need never stick fast in an immediacy similar to that of forms found earlier on. This objectivity must accordingly be comprehensible as a constant factor mediating between past and future, and must be possible to demonstrate that it is everywhere the product of man and of the development of society. It is hard to see the difference between this good objectivity and the persistence of something like reification in a context where it has become more malleable instead of rigidly determining for the human lives it shapes. If this theory remains implicit, this is because the Marxist tradition holds no place for it. The elimination of the commodity form would seem to eliminate its effect. Reification. <clears throat> for Marx, the alternative is planning of some unspecified sort under the control of the assembled producers. But Lucas has read Weber and knows that planning requires administration, which is just another instance of reification. He cannot consider the state as a simple institutional solution to the problem of reification. His later book on Lenin suggests a combination of the Soviets and a more or less conventional state apparatus under party control, but his analysis is brief and inconclusive, and history has refuted it at least in the form it took in the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, this speculation on the socialist state shows how Lucas intended his theory of rationality to be realized, in the practice of the identical subject object. All this suggests a very different image of socialist revolution from the classic one derived from the French and Russian experiences. Those revolutions are generally understood as one-time breaks in the continuity of history. Although this idea still influences Lucas's notion of historical development as a sudden reversal, how could it not in 1923 
His theory implies an evolutionary pattern in which reification and its overcoming stand in a permanent relationship of ever-renewed conflict and resolution, beginning before the overthrow of capitalism and continuing long afterwards. <clears throat> The revolution would alter the conditions of that conflict, favoring agency over structure, but it would do no more than institute new terms of struggle. Human action in modern societies, whether capitalist or socialist, continually constructs reified social objects out of the underlying human relations on which it is based. The reified form of objectivity of these objects gives a measure of stability and control while at the same time sacrificing significant dimensions of the human lives they structure. The chief difference between capitalism and socialism is not that the one is reified and the other de-reified, but rather that the one stands or falls with reification while the other can support a continual mediating and transforming of reified social objects in order to realize the potential of those sacrificed dimensions. This approach implies a theory of, mo of modernity as a differentiated social formation with two variants, a capitalist one in which reification is predominant and resistance is suppressed, and a socialist one in which resistances modify malleable reified systems subject to continuous revision. The theoretical possibility of a socialist variant undoes the most important consequences of reification namely the misrecognition of its own social contingency. Once that possibility is established, reification appears not as a second nature, alien to subjectivity, but as a mediated product of subjectivity properly understood. Society is no longer seen as subordinate to laws that cannot change, because those laws are revealed as social products. This perception subverts the functional role of, of reification under capitalism that consists precisely in blocking consciousness of the productive power of collective action. What are the philosophical implications of Lucas's dialectic? The basic demand of reason is that knowledge and action stand in essential relation to reality itself. Reified rationality and its technical practice cannot fulfill this demand because it cannot penetrate the contents of its forms specifically the life process underlying capitalism. By contrast, dialectical rationality and the proletarian revolution that corresponds to it reach down into those contents by modifying their form of objectivity, hence also their function in the social totality. This is not a superficial change in quantity or quality, but a fundamental change in meaning, in nature nor is it the full-blown constitution of reality by a social version of the transcendental subject. Rather, subject-object identity is achieved in society through a process of mediation. But the question remains, can that process of mediation be extended beyond society, specifically to nature? Unless subject, unless subject and object can be united in every domain, the demands of reason are not fulfilled. Lucas's attempt to address this problem is the subject of the next chapter.